Today is World Hepatitis Day. Every year, more than a million people die from liver cancer and cirrhosis, which are caused by viral hepatitis. The numbers are staggering for a disease for which vaccines and a treatment are now available. Globally, viral hepatitis B and C affect 325 million people. But only one in 10 of those people have been tested and only one in five have received appropriate treatment. The World Health Organization wants to eliminate hepatitis by 2030, but some experts are now asking whether the COVID-19 pandemic could derail that goal. Welcome to your COVID-19 special here on DW News. I'm Monica Jones in Berlin. Good to have you with us. SARS-CoV-2 isn't our only enemy. Amid the coronavirus pandemic, viral hepatitis continues to claim thousands of lives every day. Worth remembering what we're up against. There are five main strains of the hepatitis virus, referred to as types A, B, C, D and E. According to the World Health Organization, millions of sufferers are unaware of the disease, which slowly creeps up on them with an inflammation of the liver unbeknown to them. All hepatitis pathogens, except for C, are preventable via vaccine. The lack of testing also means many cases are discovered too late. And that for a disease that spreads easily and E, through poor food hygiene, dirty water, and lack of sanitation. The rest, B, C, and D, e, are all spread via blood, semen, and other bodily fluids. And for more, I'm joined by Rolf Hemke, the spokesman of the German Association of Research-Based Pharmaceutical Companies. Good to have you with us. Uh, so please tell me, how is the fight against COVID-19 affecting the fight against hepatitis? It's affected in two ways, really. One is that vaccination campaigns get interrupted in quite a number of countries because um, the uh, healthcare system is so occupied with dealing with COVID-19. And the other problem is that patients are afraid to go to the doctor because they are afraid to <laughs> contract COVID-19 in the waiting room, really. And so if they suspect that they may have got infected uh, with uh, some kind of hepatitis, they don't seek diagnosis and don't seek treatment. Of course, that, that is a, a phenomenon that uh, we see with, with a lot of other illnesses, uh, heart attacks and so forth. Um, hepatitis, however, is, is also known as the silent epidemic. What actually do we need to know about it? How, how does it differ from COVID-19? <laughs> well, hepatitis is actually not one disease. It's at least five different diseases. They are all caused by viruses, but they have a different cause. So the dangerous ones, really the most dangerous ones, are B, C and D. And... Uh, these hepatitis, especially B and C, they can be really silent. That is, you are infected for years without noticing. You have no symptoms, you feel well, everything's fine. And only after years, when the viruses really uh, have done much harm to your liver, you start to feel symptoms. That's why it's called silent. Right. And of course, there is no vaccine against hepatitis C yet, uh, but there are certain drugs to treat hepatitis C patients. Uh, so, Rolf Hemke, we'll talk about that in a moment. Don't go anywhere. Uh, let's just have a quick look <laughs> at where we stand with the treatment for hepatitis C and how this could perhaps also help COVID-19 patients. Around 1% of the world's population, 71 million people have hepatitis C. The virus is transmitted through infected blood, for example, from shared syringes, toothbrushes, razors, and through unprotected sex. And sterilized equipment in tattoo studios is also a risk. It causes three to four million new infections every year. 
The virus attacks the liver and causes an infection, which can have serious complications, such as liver cancer or cirrhosis. There is no vaccine, but there are medicines to treat the infection. For decades, researchers have given intense study to the hepatitis C virus. That could help in the search for a medicine to fight COVID-19. Researchers at the University of Mainz in Germany have fed reams of data into their supercomputer. The computer simulates the effects of 42,000 substances tested in hepatitis research against the coronavirus. The result? Four hepatitis medications contain active ingredients which could hinder replication of the coronavirus. That discovery could accelerate the targeted development of a drug. Rolf Hemke of the German Association of Research-Based Pharmaceutical Companies. Ideally, we find a therapy that helps both hepatitis C and COVID-19 patients. But what are the chances? Well, it would be absolutely fantastic if one of those drugs uh, would be really suited to treat COVID-19 because we, we know them well. We know that uh, the side effects are minimal. So uh, these are the kinds of medicines you really want to have. Uh, it just takes time. Uh, the supercomputer is right at the beginning. Then, of course, you have to verify those results in cell cultures, for example, because uh, the reality uh, in a biological system is uh, another level of complexity above a supercomputer. And if it turns out good, then you can use them in clinical trials. So at the moment, um, the, the front runners are actually different drugs. Uh, medicines which are uh, contain antibodies which have been copied from antibodies found in the blood of ex patients uh, ex covid-19 patients so they seem to have the best chances right now in order to uh, cure covid-19 patients is that one of the best shots that we're having right now it's certainly one of the best shots and it's an approach which you can uh, pursue fairly quickly. Uh, we know how to handle antibodies, we know how to produce them, mass produce them with biotechnology. And so if this turns out to be a good approach, we can have uh, a mass production of them and handling in the clinics quite quickly. But uh, these are just some of the many, many approaches we have. We have stopped counting. Uh, it's something 200 plus medicines that are actually uh, tested uh, for their suitability against COVID-19. Among them, some hepatitis medicines. All right. Well, that sounds promising. Uh, and hopefully very soon we're lucky and, and, and find the right therapy for all those diseases. Rolf Hemke from the German Pharmaceutical Industries Association, thank you so much for your time. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> thank you. Now then, how are animals faring in the pandemic? Well, that depends, of course, on where they live and how they're kept. Two penguins, young ones at the Brookfield Zoo in Chicago, are visibly enjoying being pampered by the zoo staff. They hatched just about a month ago, and the zoo says they're thriving and growing fast. Brookfield Zoo's indoor animal buildings, of course, have been temporarily closed to guests due to COVID-19 pandemic. And the reason we show you this, well, we thought we'd share those pictures with you because many of you keep asking about animals and COVID-19. In fact, that is uh, the question that our science correspondent Derek Williams is going to answer now. What are the updates on infection in pets? This is a question I answered back in March based on a preprint study that has since been peer-reviewed and published, but because it's asked over and over, I guess it's time for a general reminder. Um, the authors found that of the common pets challenged with the virus, uh, ferrets could be infected but weren't very contagious. Uh, cats appeared most at risk of both developing disease and passing it along to other cats. Um, dogs, on the other hand, 
didn't appear to be very susceptible. But um, other animals might contribute to outbreaks. Uh, a lot of mink have been culled on fur farms in Denmark, um, Spain, and the Netherlands in the last few months. Uh, animal welfare groups say, say well over a million uh, after the discovery that they could contract and pass on the disease not only to other mink, but also very likely to pets like, like cats. Um, the fear is that fur farms could act as a reservoir for the virus and, and thereby contribute to future outbreaks. Um, in general, though, current thinking is, is that the chance of transmission from pets or other animals to people, that it's quite low. Um, the infected mink called on the fur farms in Europe probably contracted it originally from the humans who worked there. What's dangerous is the pneumonia. Why not find a cure or treatment for the pneumonia instead of the virus? Pneumonia is a, a blanket term that's generally defined as a more or less serious inflammation of the tissue in your air passages and or your lungs. Um, it can be caused by a number of different pathogens, uh, both viral and bacterial. Uh, the pneumonia that COVID-19 can cause is generally initiated by the virus and can't be treated, for example, with antibiotics, uh, which only kill bacteria. Uh, when they're infected with SARS-CoV-2, the cells in the small sacs in your lungs where gas exchange occurs, uh, the alveoli, uh, they begin to die and clog them up. And, and that can eventually lead to what's called acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, as the pneumonia progresses, the situation can be exacerbated by the immune system, causing massive inflammation, which is supposed to help get the infection under control, but which, which actually makes things worse. Um, so treating or curing coronavirus pneumonia means either addressing the problem at its root, which is the SARS-CoV-2 infection itself, or somehow altering the body's response to it. The coronavirus pandemic has also changed the lives of millions of goats, sheep and camels. Normally, they'd now get sold at major markets ahead of Eid al-Adha, the festival of sacrifice. But this year, fears about catching the virus are keeping customers away. And faced with deserted markets, livestock breeders and traders have turned to websites, apps and social media to showcase their animals. The Festival of Sacrifice is one of two major holy days observed by Muslims across the world, including some 600 million in South Asia.